be asking you for recommendations and next steps. And Dr. Tim is going to push us every step of the way in the next hour. Tim, please come forward. Well, thank you very much for that um, very nice introduction. Um, I'm not quite 12 years old, but there was an awkward moment at dinner yesterday when they offered me wine and I had to say, no, I'm below the age. <laughs> um, that, that's not true, by the way. Um, first of all, let me say, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody in the back. So I want to first thank Age Friendly Edmonton and Sage for having me here today, as well as the incredible committee of activists who have made this event happen and have made this report happen. Um, something we talk a lot about is if you don't count, you're not counted. And this kind of report is essential for making sure that the voices of the LGBTQ older adult population um, are heard, are heard in your government and are heard by your fellow activists um, and your fellow people working for social justice. So the title of my talk today is What Makes LGBTQ Older Adults Unique? So not what makes you more vulnerable, or necessarily what makes you more resilient, but what is it that makes this community different from non-LGBTQ identified folks? Um, so just a quickly, a little bit about myself. I work for two different organizations. I apologize, you can't quite see this super well. Um, the first organization is also called SAGE, but it's a different SAGE. Uh, which was very confusing when I first received an, uh, an offer to come and speak to this group. Um, but my stage stands for Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. And I work primarily out of New York City, where we have four different LGBT senior centers. Um, we also do a lot of national training work and national advocacy work. And we run something called the National Resource Center on LGBT Aging. So our website is right there on the bottom. It's lgbtagingcenter.org. And this is where we are like a vacuum cleaner. We have just pulled together and sucked up every bit of information that we can find about LGBT aging. So a lot of it is very specific to the United States legal system and legal um, trials that are happening but quite a bit of it would easily translate to a Canadian setting. It's a lot of testimonials, it's a lot of psychosocial work, a lot of information on health disparities that we know are um, similar across both different countries. It's also through the National Resource Center that we do trainings. And my primary responsibility is to go out into the community and train people on the needs and culture of LGBT people, and specifically, LGBT older adults. So we're going to cover three topics today. Um, and we're going to do so kind of quickly, so let me know if I'm, I'm speaking too quickly, but I will pause for questions periodically. The first thing we're going to look at is some of the unique issues that are facing LGBTQ older adults. Second, reasons why members of this population might be much more hesitant or fearful to reach out to care providers. And then third, some best practices that all of us can introduce into our professional settings and our personal lives to try to make the situation better. So my talk today is geared both toward LGBTQ identified people, but also allies and caregivers who are interested in working with this community in the best way possible. So first, I always begin by going over some key terminology. And for the veterans of the movement in the room, I guarantee you, you will learn something new as I go through these key terms. So LGBTQ, an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, and queer. So we know this acronym is always, it's kind of like an accordion, right? It's always expanding and contracting depending on the context that you're in. But these are the, the words that we're going to be using throughout today's presentation. A lesbian uh, typically describes a woman who is attracted to other women. And gay describes a man who is attracted to other men, primarily same-sex attractions. But gay can also be an umbrella term, as we know, 
for anyone with same-sex attractions. Bisexual describes someone who's attracted to both men and women in some way. So I know that that definition is so general, it is almost meaningless. You know, somehow in some way attracted to both men and women. But I'm doing that on purpose, because I find a lot of people think that to be a quote unquote real bisexual, you have to have an even amount of attraction for both men and women, <laughs> you know? So like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you date men, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, women, and then on Sunday, you just like have some time to yourself to relax, you know? <laughs> But that's not at all true. Um, and those of you who are bisexual identified will recognize that as a very negative stereotype. That just means that in some way you find yourself attracted to both men and women. So in terms of aging and end of life care, I was very interested to hear about the work that's happening at Simon Fraser, and I've been following this project. I'm very excited about it. But it's important that we, as LGBTQ identified people, don't fall into the trap of making bisexual folks invisible. So what I mean by that is, let's say that I've been married to a woman for 20 years, and then I decide to divorce. We decide to divorce, and I start dating a man. We might very quickly fall into the trap of thinking, oh good, he finally came out. He's finally living his authentic life. Whereas, that might not be the case. It could be the case that I identify as bisexual, I was with a woman, now I happen to be with a man. And we know that at the end of life, family members tend to come back on the scene. Family members that you might not have spoken to for very many years. So if you're a care provider, it's good that you recognize that it might not be that this person has just come out, but rather different stages on their experience as a bisexual identified person. Transgender is a word that describes someone whose gender identity is um, somehow different from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Gender identity or gender expression is different from that assigned sex. So when we say sex assigned at birth, what am I talking about here? Um, how many of you in the audience, by a show of hands, have children? So a handful of people. What's the first question that somebody asks when they find out that you've had a child? Is it a boy or a girl? You'd think the first question would be like red or white wine. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, no, but the question is always, is it a boy or is it a girl? And that decision is usually made just by looking at the genitals of the child. Because the child does not have a gender identity, the child is not capable of expressing gender in that moment. So we use the language of assigned sex to capture the fact that there was no consultation with the person who, who you just gave an M or an F on their birth certificate. So transgender is an umbrella term that speaks to many, many different experiences in which there's some kind of um, disjuncture between that assigned sex and gender identity. Some people will use hormones or different surgical means to bring their body in line with their identity. Many people do not um, do any kind of medical means. So there's a lot of different ways to identify as transgender. And something that I always want to mention is that it's not at all uncommon for people to come out and begin transitioning later in life. And specifically after what we call a major life event. So maybe you retire and you're no longer scared of losing your job. So you're, you kind of have the space to transition. Or your kids go to college or you divorce or your spouse dies. These are often events where somebody thinks, okay, now's the time I'm gonna begin this journey. Just by a show of hands, how many of you know the term cisgender? How many of you? So more than what I'm usually giving this talk. But the word cisgender describes someone whose gender identity, so how they feel about themselves on the inside, their sense of self, does align with the sex that they were assigned at birth. So let's say you were born, the doctor said it's a girl, you were treated as a girl and later a woman your whole life, and that was never a source of conflict for you. You've always identified with the sex that you've been treated as your entire life. So I'm not just teaching you this word because I love ever-expanding lists of words, although that is true. Um, the reason that I'm teaching you this word is that it helps us to break down the view 
that there are transgender people and there are typical or normal people. Because when we think in those ways, it makes the transgender community seem somehow less than. It's disrespectful of their experience and their identities. So to kind of get beyond thinking in that you know, either or kind of way, I really like the word cisgender because it helps us realize that we all have a gender identity, even if it's not one that we've had to really think about in the way that some other folks might have had to reckon with their gender identity. So that's a very new term for a lot of people. I'll go ahead and pause just quickly to see if there are questions. Please. That's an excellent question. So to, just in case you couldn't hear, the question was, um, if somebody has transitioned and they feel very comfortable with their body and the relationship it has to their gender identity, could they use that term cisgender to describe their experience? Ultimately, that's up to whoever is using the word to describe their experience. Um, you know, I think the number one thing that we can learn as allies to people who are different from ourselves is that Whatever term makes sense to describe your experience is the term that you ought to use and that makes sense. Um, so some trans folk do definitely prefer to identify as trans, um, that that experience is a, a meaningful part of their identity that they want to be known. Many other transgender people simply identify as the gender that they are, the gender of their lived experience, in which case they might not use the word trans. They might use the word cis, I don't know, it's kind of individual. Um, but I think, again, it's all about respecting the preferred term of whoever it is that you're interacting with on a one-on-one -on -one level. Excellent question. So the last two terms, just to wrap up the acronym, two-spirit is a term that usually indicates a native person who feels their body manifests both masculine and feminine um, energy or spirit. And then queer, as many of you know, is a reclaimed term that oftentimes points to the same community or experience as LGBTT, but queer can sometimes be a more kind of fluid term, uh, something that's a little less about, you know, which category do you fit into. So when we're thinking about language, there are some very specific generational concerns that we have to be aware of. The first is to recognize that these terms are constantly evolving. You know, one thing that I tell folks is that it's my job to know what's happening in the LGBT community and be able to explain it outside of the community. That's kind of my main function. And I still hear new terms like once a month and I have no idea what it means. You know, somebody will come in and drop a word and I think, oh man, I've never heard that one before. I have to figure out what that means. And I think that's really exciting. But it's important to recognize that as a community, we are particularly good at kind of changing the meanings of the terms that we're using to describe ourselves. And a lot of those differences are generational. So for example, queer is a word that we never use at SAGE. And the reason that we never use it is that for many people it has a very long history of being a slur, as being the kind of word that you hear uh, before someone reacts violently to you or tries to harm you in some way. So for a lot of people, that's not the case. It's a term that they've reclaimed, that they use very comfortably and very fluidly. But I found, certainly, that if I accidentally use that word um, in a group of older folks, and especially like people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, um, it can really put a chill into the air very quickly, even though they know that I'm an ally and that I'm gay identified. So it's not true across the board, but it's the kind of difference that we need to be aware of. Similarly with homosexual, that word can carry a very medical connotation for a lot of people. Um, something that we'll talk about later is when homosexuality was decriminalized. But before that, it was a term that very many people might have been scared to hear used, either to apply to themselves or in conversation about another person. And then finally, there's a big evolution happening, um, certainly in some of the, the areas in which I work, between 
how do we respectfully talk about and refer to the older members of our community? So I've noticed a very, very concerted shift away from terms like elderly. Um, you know, it kind of tends to imply like the village elder to whom you can ask for advice, which is a pretty limiting view of, of how someone ought to behave or be in the world. And likewise, I'm noticing a shift away from senior and senior citizen as well. So again, this is just a matter of personal choice, depending on what term it is that you use. But we've begun to move toward older adult as kind of the most literal, value-free way to describe a group of people that doesn't have some of the potentially positive or negative connotations of some of these other terms. So as I said in answer to this question, the best thing that you can do is just be sensitive to preferred terms. You know, don't meet someone and think like, oh, that person's definitely bisexual. If they haven't told you they're bisexual, you can't make that assumption. But once you do know the terms that somebody uses, you should feel comfortable reflecting those terms back. So for example, last night when I was with dinner, uh, at dinner with the committee, I noticed that everybody was using the term queer very freely. And that told me, okay, fine, this is a word that I can use in this context. People aren't going to be offended by that. It's that kind of sensitivity and reflection of terms that we think is one of the best ways to be an ally. So when in doubt, follow their lead. Follow the lead of the person that you're speaking to. So a lot of times when I am giving these presentations, people kind of wonder why I'm even in the room. Why is it that we're talking about LGBTQ older adults? And the reason for that is that this is a community that very often uh, kind of falls through the cracks. Because as many of you know, the kind of LGBTQ queer movement can be very, very centered on youth and can be very, very centered on less so now issues like marriage equality, um, but things that tend to skew younger. Also, there's a tremendous amount of ageism in the LGBTQ community, the kind of way in which you become invisible past a certain age. But we also know that mainstream aging service providers are often not at all clued in to the unique needs of this community. And many groups don't even ask if people are LGBTQ identified. So a huge problem that we have is even getting a sense of the visibility of this community. So some specific stats to Edmonton. Um, these are a little difficult to find with regard to this community, but we know that the general population of the city is somewhere in the high 800,000s, and people over the age of 70 are about 129,000, give or take. So we can do a bunch of math and try to figure out exactly how many of those folks are LGBTQ identified, but even this not super fine grain set of numbers lets us know that there's, this is a huge population, you know, much larger than just the people in this room. It'd be much easier if it was only you guys. <laughs> you know, we, could, we could just all sit down and make a phone tree and figure out how to take care of one another, um, but that's certainly not the point. And also important to realize that this is an issue that cuts across all different racial and ethnic identities as well. So we know in the area, in terms of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis population, it's a little over 50,000 who fall into this category. So when we're thinking about what makes this population unique, there are a lot of things that we can focus on, but I want to focus in on just two. The first is that many members of this community live alone and rely on other older adults for their informal caregiving. And by informal care, I mean care that is not provided by a paid professional. The second is that a long history of discrimination has left members of this community very fearful of interacting with service providers. So let's take a look at these two things a little more closely. Looking at the data from this report, um, the disparity in Edmonton is actually much less than in many of the US cities that I typically work in. But we're going to be looking at two things. We're going to be looking at a bar graph of the LGBTQ population compared with the general population. 
So in terms of aging as a single person, so aging not in a relationship, either marriage, civil partnership, dating, anything like that, that's true of 40% of the general population. And we know that about 41% of Edmonton's older adult population lives alone. So we see just slight differences here. 44% um, of LGBTQ older adults in Edmonton live alone, so slightly higher likelihood there. Or I'm sorry, age as a single person. But only 36% live alone. So actually slightly fewer members of this community are living without any kind of support or relationship in the home. So these numbers, when I do them in New York City, are remarkably different. Um, it's something like 70% of LGBTQ older adults live alone, and 60% are not in a relationship. Um, so that's actually very encouraging news for the Edmonton population, and is definitely a place for future research um, to make sure that the way in which this data is being collected is as accurate kind of across the board as possible. But one thing that I think is the case here is that typically informal caregiving is what we call vertical caregiving. So for members of the non-LGBTQ population, when you take care of one another, it tends to happen between different age groups. So for example, the child can take care of a parent who can then take care of the grandchildren and as the grandchildren get over, they can take over some of the responsibility of caring for their parent and grandchildren as well. So things are happening kind of on this vertical axis. What we found is that members of the LGBTQ population are much more likely to live in what we call horizontal care relationships. So what this means is that the people who are providing your kind of day-to-day -day informal care, things like shoveling your driveway, getting your food, uh, maybe helping you in and out of the shower, getting dressed, things like that, these folks in the LGBTQ community are often the same age. And there are a lot of different reasons for this. Um, a lot of the reason is because many of us, when we come out, are kicked out of our biological or legal families. So we create what we call families of choice. We surround ourselves with other people who serve as our primary supports, but those families of choice are more often than not people who are more or less our same age. So it's pretty obvious how this would put someone in a more vulnerable situation. If two people are both in their mid-80s and are one another's primary care providers, it's much more difficult to effectively care for one another. Because a lot of care is just elbow grease, you know? It's being able to help people move, get in and out of situations, uh, get dressed, things like that. So next, I kind of want to touch on this question of historical experience and how some different experiences that you've been through in your life can help to shape who you are as an individual and how you respond to the situation you find yourself in. So we know that LGBTQ older adults have been through a much different experience than younger folks. That the history that you've lived through has a real clear impact on your feeling of comfort in the world and your feeling of safety in the world. So in a second, I'm going to go through a timeline to kind of give everybody a sense of the, the kinds of experiences that I'm talking about. But I want to preface that by saying that there are a lot of different ways that people cope with the experience of being discriminated against. So one such way is to become closeted or to become invisible. I think a lot of us are familiar with this dynamic. Um, one thing that I always work very hard to get people to understand is that coming out is not something that you do just once. You know, coming out is something that you have to do over and over again every day. It's always a decision whether or not you're going to be open about your identity. So for a lot of older folks, when they're feeling vulnerable already for whatever psychological or physiological reason, 
uh, might decide it's easier to go back into the closet than it is to risk being open in a particular encounter. Oftentimes we develop very strong self-reliance and make home a safe space, where your home becomes the one place where you can let your guard down and be fully yourself. And then finally, we'll find ourselves being open with an increasingly limited number of people. And here again, both the strength but also the risk of families of choice becomes very obvious. Because this family of choice is your main support. They're the people who have helped you get through to the point you're at today. But if they're the only people who know you're LGBTQ identified, as those members of your family of choice get older, maybe become increasingly homebound, or begin to pass on, that means that the circle of people who know you for your full identity, your full self, is also shrinking at one and the same time, which leads to much, much higher rates of isolation and the health, the negative health ramifications that go along with isolation. So to give you a sense for this, I'm going to walk through one person's life, a person named Bill, who may or may not be a real person, who may or may not be in this room right now. Um, so let's just take an example from Bill's life to see how old he was when some major Canadian LGBTQ events happened. So Bill was born in 1936, and in 1942, the RCMP and Edmonton City Police participated in one of the largest dragnet operations targeting gay men in Western Canadian history. So Bill's only six years old when this is happening. Chances are it doesn't touch directly on his life, but sends a very clear message that this is an identity, this is not welcome, this is a group of people who are going to be actively targeted by law enforcement. In 1969, Bill moved to Edmonton to join his partner Gordon. In that same year, Club 70 opens and quickly closes. Later this year, the Criminal Law Amendment Act decriminalized homosexuality. So comparable things happened in the United States. And one thing that I often talk about is I try to get people to imagine the experience of living 33 years of your life knowing that you could be criminally prosecuted for same-sex consensual sexual contact. You know, the kind of romantic expression of your genuine identity. In 1978, Anita Bryant visited Edmonton. I'm sure many of you remember this. Um, but, you know, imagine, or many of you don't have to imagine you were here, but having an entire stadium packed with people who want to see some woman rail against how horrible you are. And what message that sends about the priorities of your town and the priorities of the people you share your space with. In 1981, Edmonton's Pisces bathhouse was raided by police. 53 found in people were charged. So Bill was 45 when this happened. In 1984, the first case of HIV AIDS was diagnosed in Edmonton when Bill was 48. And in 1998, the Supreme Court ruled in Vrind versus Alberta that the Alberta government has to include sexual orientation in human rights legislation. So Bill had to wait until he was 62 years old until the laws started to kind of catch up with his own experience in many ways. In 2005, the Civil Marriage Act legalized same-sex marriage across Canada. And last year in 2014, Lori Blakeman introduced the Safe and Inclusive Schools Act, which supported gay-straight alliances in Alberta schools. So I ended with this last one because Many of us can remember how working with children was often the most fraught topic when it came to sexual minorities. So that was Anita Bryant's whole thing, you know, won't somebody think of the children? And to think it took until 2014 to really have people pushing for the legitimacy of LGBTQ spaces for kids. The other thing I want to point out is how many of these advances are relatively recent. Um, and I mean, Canada was well before the United States on many of these things. So in both contexts, the positive gains that we've seen for this community 
are really mostly within the last 10, 15, possibly 20 years. So for those of you folks in the room who are younger and might not have lived through a lot of these things, it's really worthwhile to think about the impact of living most of your life, 60 years of your life, in an environment that was extremely hostile to your identity. And we know that that hostility makes it much more likely that people will be hesitant to reach out to health and social services. Because what this timeline really points out to us is that discrimination against the LGBTQ community is not just an issue of a couple bad people reaching out and harming somebody around them. The discrimination was at the hands of the government, the law enforcement, major religious institutions, medical institutions. These kind of cornerstones of our society were the very organizations telling us that our lives were not worthwhile. So now when you need to go to a hospital, when you need to go to a doctor, when you need to approach law enforcement because you've been abused or taken advantage of, that relationship is much more fraught. It's much more difficult to place your trust in these institutions that have a long history of not being welcome, welcoming to the LGBTQ community. And again, it's important to realize that people of color and Aboriginal folks also have had to deal with not only the pressures of being LGBTQ, but the kind of double ramification of um, being otherwise minoritized in our societies. So kind of pulling apart those different contexts can often be very difficult. Which is why it's important to remember that the LGBT, LGBTQ community is just as diverse as every other community. You know, I love thinking about the fact that our community will continue to be a part of every other group in every generation all across the world. It's very interesting and very kind of unique in that sense in very many ways. So my reason for pointing this out, um, for those of you who are members of the community, is to make sure that you are always being vigilant about issues of racial, ethnic, and religious justice, in addition to issues of ability and class as well. But to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, we're helping the LGBTQ folks, and that's kind of our job. It's also our job to be sensitive to other ways in which our struggle intersects with the struggle of other groups. And for those of you who are care providers, if you find out that somebody that you're caring for is LGBTQ, don't think, oh, great, well, that's the source of all their struggles. <laughs> you know, there are plenty of other things that can make our lives difficult. So it might be the case that somebody needs to find, say, a bisexual affirming support group, but it also might be the case that what they really need is to talk to a case manager who speaks Tagalog or who speaks Cantonese. You have to kind of sort out what's the real presenting issue here and how can I see the person that I'm working with as holistically as possible. So let's talk about some best practices. Let's talk about some things that we can do, uh, both as individuals and as members of organizations, to be sure that we're putting our best foot forward and to be sure that we're helping LGBTQ older adults. <clears throat> so on the individual level, it's important that you don't assume that everyone is heterosexual and cisgender. You don't want folks to be straight until proven gay. That's not a good way to start your working relationship with them. <clears throat> so for example, it's very common when you first meet someone to say, are you married? Especially as part of an intake questionnaire. Um, and I think for very many of us, marriage, yes, you know, there's marriage equality, but it still kind of carries that connotation or assumption of heterosexuality. So rather than say that, you could say something like, who are the most important people in your life? Or tell me a little bit about yourself. And that kind of open-ended conversation doesn't make an assumption about somebody's identity. The second is to expand your definition of family. Families are not just nuclear families. We're not all related biologically or legally. So it's important to think about how it is that you can support alternate family structures. 
and whatever that means, whether it be families of choice, maybe polyamorous relationships, um, kind of cooperative living environments, those are all very important family structures that need to be intelligible to aging providers. So when we think about end-of-life care, if somebody needs to be planning for end-of-life care, and you say, well, are you married or divorced, the answer is probably going to be neither. But that doesn't tell you that this person's roommate or best friend or neighbor down the hall is effectively their family and ought to be involved in these end-of-life decisions and end-of-life planning conversations. So again, having these open-ended, more robust conversations is a much better way to get accurate information about the support structures that LGBTQ older adults um, are engaged in. Always, always, always use preferred names and pronouns. Um, you know, everybody has a preferred name, right? Uh, Candace, the organizer who's been so helpful today, came up to me and said, Tim or Timothy? And I was just like, whoa, Tim. <laughs> Don't call me Timothy, I'll feel like I'm in trouble and it'll really throw me off all day. <laughs> so we all have the right to be called what we would like to be called. And for some of us, that name uh, might have a different gender connotation than the name that's on our legal documents, for example. So it's important that you ask people about their preferred names and that you stick to it, and pronouns as well. And for those of you who don't have as much experience working within the transgender community, um, if you make a mistake, if you use the wrong name, if you use the wrong pronoun, acknowledge it, apologize, say, I'm sorry, I'm working on it, I'm doing better, it won't happen again. It's much better to be forthright and to be apologetic and partner with the person that you're talking to than it is to kind of ignore that it ever happened and let that awkwardness become you know, a part of your, your relationship with that person. To the best degree that you can, be clear about privacy protections. So if you're working with somebody in a professional environment or even you know, as, a, as an activist coming on to help your organization, any time that you're asking personal information, especially if you're recording that information, give the person that you're talking to a sense of who's going to see it. Is it protected by legal protective measures, or is this the kind of form that goes into a file where anybody could have access to it? That's really important information for people to have if they're going to feel comfortable self-identifying as LGBTQ. From an organizational level, there are also many things that you can do. The first is to train your staff. And I'm not just saying that because my job is to train people. <laughs> and if everybody stops doing this, I won't have a job. Um, but it's important to give your staff the knowledge that they need to be inclusive. So for an LGBT organization, this training might be around aging issues and ageism within the community. Or you might have identified that your staff could be better on bisexuality issues or could really benefit from some anti-racism training, social justice training. For those of you who work in the mainstream world, the non-LGBTQ, it might be the kind of LGBTQ 101 presentation that many different groups receive. But the reason for this is that you can't hold someone accountable for their behavior if they don't know what's acceptable or unacceptable behavior. A lot of times when I'm giving these trainings, somebody will say something that to me is just like, whoo, like really offensive and they have no idea that they just cause offense. They have no idea that that term isn't in use, or they had no idea the implication of what they're saying. So it's really important as we're creating inclusive environments to be very transparent about expectations so that people can be fairly held accountable for their behavior. Creating diverse boards and diverse leadership is also tremendously important. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to have a really robust LGBTQ program if there are no LGBTQ people involved in the planning or execution of that program. You know, one of the simplest ways to be sure that your organization is on track is to have an organization that is reflective of the community that you're trying to serve. So that could mean really proactive outreach to different board members. Um, 
I don't think Michael, is, Michael Fair is taking on any new board memberships. Yesterday I asked how many he was on and it took a good 30 seconds for him to <laughs> come up with that number. But there are a lot of people in this room who could connect you with folks who are interested in that kind of engagement. Collaborate with LGBT organizations and likewise, LGBTQ organizations try to increase your outreach to aging network providers. So you certainly have a tremendous ally here with SAGE and Age Friendly Edmonton, uh, but continue creating those relationships so that you have access to technical advice and help. Um, <clears throat> this is something I realized I didn't research enough, so you might have mandated forms that do collect this information, which I'm seeing head shaking no. Um, so it's important to ask on your intake forms about sexual orientation and gender identity. Like I said before, if you don't count, you're not counted. But not only in terms of getting the best information about constituents, it's also a really important way to send the message that your organization is open to working with the LGBTQ community. So even the fact that these questions are on a form can often signal, oh hey, I'm talking to somebody who gets it. I'm talking to somebody who recognizes that my community exists. And finally, to the best of your ability, incorporate photos of LGBT people and also LGBT symbols into whatever public-facing materials that you have. And here, for LGBTQ organizations, your work is going to be to have your images not only represent inclusive sexual orientations and gender identities, but also racial and ethnic inclusivity, ability, um, and to the degree to which you can in visual representations, class. But just making sure that what you're putting out there in the world reflects who it is that you're trying to have walk through your door and the kind of environment you want to cultivate. In the States, we have like two pictures of older lesbian women that are in the public domain that like anyone can use. <laughs> so I mean, I like once a week, I'm just like, oh, there's Bernice again, you know? <laughs> like, on some website or what have you. Um, so we are working really hard at Sage to produce a cache of free use images, um, which you all would be able to use as well, of really diverse um, older adults. Um, but that's something to think about in terms of your own materials audit and the, the image that your organization is projecting out toward the world. So uh, in, when I was introduced, it was noted, and I really appreciated this, that um, you know, awareness is great, training is great, but action is what we really need. That's the thing that's gonna push things forward. And the rest of today's discussion is very much centered around next steps, and is very much centered around taking a level of awareness that might hopefully have been raised a little bit this morning, and certainly after we look at the report, and moving that awareness into something really concrete. So I'm not going to ask you this question out loud necessarily, but what I want you to think about <clears throat> is what is one thing I can start doing differently to better serve, to better help, to better access, to better support the LGBTQ older adult community. So with that, I want to say, go get them. <laughs> <laughs> you guys now have a really fabulous tool to start doing advocacy. It's so rich with so much data, and there's such an incredible room of people here with a lot of experience, a lot of energy, and a lot of motivation that I think this is a watershed moment for the community, not only in Edmonton and not only in Alberta, but to really create an agenda that could ripple across the whole country. Um, so there's a lot of excitement here. I'm very happy to have been a part of it. And I think, Michael, do we have time for one or two questions if there are, or? Yeah. Okay. So let's, if there are one or two questions, I'm happy to address those. Otherwise, we'll move on to the report itself. You've done such a great job. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time and attention.